Welcome to an all new episode of BNB Movie Reviews. We have another all streaming episode for you this week, starting off with Jennifer Lopez's particular set of skills as a parent, a portrait of the life and stardom of Michael J. Fox, and we ask the question again if white men really can jump. All that and more coming up next on BNB. Jennifer Lopez and Joseph Fiennes face off in their final confrontation as she protects the daughter she gave up for adoption in the new Netflix original film, The Mother. Huh, Brad. Okay, yes, The Mother. Brian. Jennifer Lopez. Uh, let's start positive. We like Jennifer Lopez, don't I we? love Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. And I feel like Jennifer Lopez has not always gotten the films that she deserves as a performer. Okay. You know, I go back to Out of Sight. One of my favorite Ooh, movies, yes. know, directed by Steven Soderbergh, yeah. co-starring George Clooney. Their chemistry is like some of the best chemistry ever put on film. Yeah. You watch that film, you're like, I want a million Jennifer Lopez movies. And then you jump to something like The Mother, and you're like, you're better than this. <laughs> You're so much better than this. Yeah, she really is. And you're right. We talked a little bit about this before. And it, it, it would be nice to see J-Lo get, like, her own action franchise, her Taken. You know how Liam Neeson had that back in the day. I mean, this wants to be John Wick, but it's probably more like Taken and yeah. probably more like Taken 3. I'm glad you mentioned that because I have to go directly to the editing of this movie. The editing of this movie feels like... And when I watched the movie, it reminded me of Taken 3, where you are just, you're trying to hide the action, you're trying to hide the choreography of the action, whether it's the performer, whether it's the Jennifer Lopez, or it's the director who doesn't really know how to shoot action. But it's There just, are some baffling editing choices, and yeah. there is one particular sequence in this movie <laughs> where Jennifer Lopez is on a motorcycle and she yeah. needs to pick up her daughter, and the way that they mask their inability to shoot that action through yeah. edits is hilarious. It just makes the movie look cheap and feel cheap. Bad. <laughs> yeah. Bad. It makes it, and then also I have to go to the script. It's, it's so funny when I was watching this movie and there was a point in the movie where she has to rescue her adopted, her, her daughter that she gave up for adoption. And because she gave up her daughter for adoption, this child doesn't know much about her biological mother. And so- And for all we know, has no questions about it either. And doesn't have any questions about it. So when this, this woman, this CIA operative, military trained woman comes and rescues you, like, there's no, there's no, first there's no conversation between Jennifer Lopez and the little girl. I kind no of like the kidnapping sequence. That was, that was cool. Where Jennifer Lopez is on high, you know, she's got a rifle, she sees the bad guys coming in through their unmarked vans, yeah. and she's going to pick them off. And like, that, that sequence was intense, and then once civilians start going down, it's like, oh, this is yeah. pretty harrowing. Yeah, yeah. But and, then, but then, yeah, but then we to get your to, point to that yeah, conversation. Yeah, then, then we get to that point where there's no conversation. They they get out from there. They get back to the states. They uh, they take refuge where they're going to switch cars at a convenience store. Throughout that whole travel, there's no conversation, at least that we see as an audience. Yeah, and then. She, the daughter makes a leap. The daughter makes an extreme leap. And in my mind, I was watching the movie and I said, don't say it. Please don't say it. And then, of course, she says it. She's like, are you my are real you my mother? mother? And I'm like, and I'm rolling my eyes. I'm like, there's no reason for her to think that 
within the context of the story that this woman would be your biological mother. And so that, that's just, to me, that's just bad script writing. But I do think that Jennifer Lopez does sell the drama of what her character is going through, the internal it, oh, torment. Yeah. The movie is such a B movie. Yeah. And so if you're going to have a B movie, you need to deliver on A action. Like if this movie turned into John Wick up from an action point of view. Like if oh, suddenly yeah. we were having sequences that were just absolutely brutal and visceral and uh, you, you felt the... Then we could forgive a lot of those shortcomings. You're yes, right. and you can't. You, you can't. Can. Because this movie doesn't really deliver on plot. It doesn't really deliver on character, and it doesn't really deliver on action. It has emotion, and, and Jennifer Lopez sells that emotion. She tries her best. But no one else has any emotion. And that, you know, and no one else is going through anything. And that's unfortunate. I mean, going from all, all the side characters, and then the villains. We talked a little bit about um, Joseph Fiennes, and we see a little bit in that. And that confrontation is, uh, if you, if you want to see the rest... Yeah. Like, I, I mean, yes. <laughs> he's got this two face thing going on. Yeah. So he's playing kind of a super villain type character. Yeah. But it doesn't quite match what Jennifer Lopez is providing. It doesn't. And so there is a clash there between them that it's like oil and water. And so again, yeah. it just highlights what's wrong about the movie. It, it, it does. Um, you said you said it's a B movie. Would you say a B minus movie? <laughs> well, at the B and B show, we only give Bs. We either say it's a great movie and we give it a B plus, yeah. or we say it's a terrible movie and we give it a B minus mm -hmm. and skip it. And I gotta tell you, the mother's a. Big B minus, yeah. a massive skip. Don't watch it on Netflix. No, no. Even though if you have Netflix, it's, it's not a movie you have to pay for. There's but so many other movies on there. It's so, it's so many more <laughs> that you could watch that's yeah. a lot better than The Mother. And if you love Jennifer Lopez, if you love, 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 and you need to see every performance, yeah. this is not the worst thing she's done. No, no, it's definitely not. And I, I'm a big fan of hers. Unfortunately, it's a B minus for me as well. So... Yeah, those are our thoughts on uh, the mother, uh, B minus for both of us. Uh, but when we return, we uh, take a look at the uh, the life and stardom of Michael J. Fox. Stay right there. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. Let 211 be your guiding light for help with food, Healthcare and other resources. 211, how can I help you? Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211, get connected, get help. I woke up and I noticed my pinky. Auto animated. Parkinson's disease. I told Tracy the news. In sickness and in health, I remember her whispering. No one outside of my family knew. There was only one reason I took these pills. To hide. But all those years of hiding was shaking me away. Denying that part of me that wants to continue to go on and do things is, is to quit. I don't accept that. Michael J. Fox's stardom rose quickly in the 80s, but when the debilitating diagnosis of Parkinson's disease struck his life, hiding it from the public and his family became just as strenuous as the disease itself in the Apple TV Plus documentary, Still a Michael J. Fox Movie. I know we both grew up massive fans of Michael J. Fox. Yeah. And I'm sure you also remember when he finally revealed his diagnosis to the public and how like shocking and hard that was yeah. as fans of him. What did you feel while you were watching this documentary? You know what? Oddly enough, the, the, the documentary itself I thought was kind of inspiring. Um, seeing just how he keeps his spirits up throughout the years of having this diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, yeah, it was, it, you do feel a, a, a lot of sadness, but because he doesn't feel sad for himself, it's inspiring to see 
the resilience of the human spirit as, well, he's, as he's been battling this. My big takeaway from the documentary was the theme of honesty and mm. being honest to yourself. Yeah. And so much of what Michael J. Fox is exploring through still yeah. is that moment when he was trying to avoid his reality yeah. and how in avoiding that reality, it was punishing to himself and to his family, his family. to his children. Yeah. And you come away from the documentary really hoping that he has found that honesty, and it's probably yeah. a long, continuous struggle yeah. to recognize the reality that he is living in, but also the nature of his disease makes it impossible for him not to live in the moment. Yeah. And I thought that was an interesting idea that I certainly had not considered as somebody not suffering from Parkinson's disease. No, you're absolutely right. And I mean, going to some of the filmmaking of the movie as well, I love the way they were able to kind of tell his story through his the clips of his movies. Yeah. You know, being able to kind of track like his his upbringing from being a child, going through his 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 his, his Start his his quick rise to stardom, or supposedly seemingly qu quick well, rise. I mean, to stardom. I think it was a quick rise to stardom. Like, yeah. I don't think you quite appreciate how fast he became a superstar. Yeah, you know, the moment he lands Family Ties, which was by no means his first gig, but by the moment he gets that, and then he's shooting Back to the Future back to back with filming the same time, it, like. He skyrockets in popularity, and yeah. that messes with him, and the film explores that as it, well. It, it explores that when he definitely has that, that and his alcohol alcoholism that he suffered to going through that as well. And I like also, how the movie is, you know, again, honest with that honest. alcoholism, with his narcissism, with the mistakes that he was making over his journey, the things that he regrets. And yeah. Like, like, it puts it all out there. It does. And you can't help but admire Michael J. Fox for allowing all this stuff to be splayed on this canvas of this television screen for us to devour. Yeah, and then another interesting part of the documentary as well was also just seeing his, um, his, his physical therapy, you know, because having Parkinson's disease, he, and he explains it, you know, he falls a lot. And when you fall, you break stuff. And he's he has pins in his hand. Pins in his face. Pins in his face from falling a lot. And, and again, to me, it just goes to the spirit that he has and how he's able to handle it. He's just like, he's like, yeah, you know, it's like when, when I have this, you know, you just fall a lot. And he just kind of just takes it in stride. And it's it's admirable to see the, the attitude. Well, he, he also has. knows what it's like to live in this world with Parkinson's he disease. Does. And he watches people avert their gaze. And so what yeah. still the documentary does is it forces yeah. us to watch. We, true. we cannot close our eyes to the experience that this person is going through. That you know, when we're on the street and we pass somebody like this, you know, we d we don't want to bother them. We don't want to like. Yeah. We don't want to So you you try to be polite but quick, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because it's scary it's to scary. experience yeah. somebody like that in your life, and so I think the documentary does a service in forcing us to watch and consider his life. Now. I'm curious about your thoughts regarding how they tell the narrative. Yes, they use his films, they choose certain clips yeah. to express the emotional beats that the documentary is trying to provide, that mm -hmm. Michael J. Fox is trying to provide, but they also do reenactments. You bring up the pinky reenactment yeah. that we see in that clip. That is a very effective use of a reenactment because it puts you in that moment with Michael J. Fox, when he when suddenly he notices that I don't have control over this finger, yeah, and how scary that could that could be. Yeah, what um, what rating would you give for this documentary? I would encourage every Michael J. Fox fan to watch it, and I would encourage non Michael J. Fox fans to watch it. Yeah, it's a big B plus. It's a it's a huge B plus. A very inspiring documentary um, for sure. So yeah, those are our thoughts on uh, still a Michael J. Fox movie. Uh, when we return. And, uh, we asked that, that, that question. Jason, let's go see your room.
This won't work here. There's too many white guys. You need to go back to the east side where they won't see you coming. The race is dated, bro. Everybody but you knows white dudes can hoop now. I'll find some marks, get in their heads, throw them off their game, and we'll clean up. I'm great at spotting mental weakness in hoopers, bro. I'm like the P.T. Anderson of basketball psychological warfare. Who is P.T. Anderson? Our greatest living director. Spike Lee is our greatest living director. Spike Lee's not even a good Knicks fan. I knew this was a mistake. Kamal and Jeremy, not Sydney and Billy, attempt to hustle for some extra cash in the remake to the 1992 classic, White Men Can't Jump. All right, Brad. So, yeah. you know, this is a remake of a film that is highly beloved, you know, by a lot of people. Certainly from, by Brian. Yeah, I, I, I love White Men Can't Jump. I mean, I, I saw that in the theaters back uh, when the original came out. Um, you know, Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson. So trying to recreate yeah. that magic. It's interesting to talk about this movie the week after having reviewed The Little Mermaid, a film that neither yeah. of us had any nostalgia toward the original. Yeah. But both of us love the original White Man Can't Jump. Yeah. And so to remake it for Hulu and just dump it on Hulu with very little fanfare, <laughs> you, you go, oh, don't, don't do the original like that. But I got to say, watching it, it does things that are a little different than the original, you know, and it's not a remake, as you said in your little introduction there. This yeah, is not Sydney and Billy. It's not, and that's the one thing that I kind of took to this, where you know I was kind of I was a little trepidatious about watching this movie because of my love for the original film. But and a lot of times you think that they're just going to do like um, a, basically a copy and paste and just kind of just recycle everything that we see from the original film. And it does have some story beats from the original I movie. I think it has definitely emotional beats. It, the emotional arc is pretty similar to the original film. Yeah, but it does it does a really decent job of being its own movie and really being able to update it to the times that we live in now, the social media era. Except it still like has that. this super '90s soundtrack that for me did not work. Oh yeah, that's right. It, it does have that. <laughs> so I, I don't know. And you know, we talked a, a, a while about a while ago about a movie called You People, which Kenya Barris, and that's the like the the um, the common factor in this that Kenya Barris also wrote this movie and then when I found that out that was something I was hesitant on. Well, we did not, not like you people. And you people to me is still one of the worst, worst movies of the year. And then going into this, I'm like, oh god, he's gonna he's gonna take something a beloved uh, a beloved movie that a lot of people like and take that and just butcher it. Doesn't really do that with this movie. It's not. I'm not gonna say this is a great film, but it does do its own thing. And I have to give props to um, the late Lance Reddick, who was in this movie, and to me, feels like he's the heart of the story for me. Yeah, he's fantastic in the film. Yeah. And it does weirdly operate as a send-off to Lance Reddick mm. that I was not expecting. And yeah. when we get to those sequences towards the end of the movie, I found it extremely emotional yeah, uh, because of the reality of Lance Reddick's passing. Yeah. But he is so good in the movie. Yeah. And he's used sparingly. This is not Lance Reddick's movie. No, you know, it's He is not. very much a supporting character. But yeah. when he's on screen, he's owning it. Yeah, and then going to the performance of uh, Cinque Walls, who has that relationship because uh, Lance Reddick plays his father. Um, again, the emotional heartbeat of the movie comes with Cinque Walls' character, I think, and that relationship and what that means going into like the, the climax of the film. Jack Harlow, um, who is the counterpart in this movie, I mean, to me it doesn't... His story is less effective. He is the weakest element of the film. Not necessarily his performance. I think he's fine. Yeah, he's fine. But his character honestly just doesn't work for me. Yeah. And, you know, he, like, his character is all about appropriation. You know, he's into Tai Chi. You know, oh, he, yeah. You know, he's, he's into meditation. You know, and they don't really confront this appropriation that he is committing constantly. Yeah. And I I just found that odd. It, it's weird, too, because the, the one thing that I liked about the original movie is the, the commentary on race relations and using that within, like, you know, the basketball hustle world that they that they occupied in that original film. And, you know, Sydney calls Billy out and Billy calls Sydney out. And this movie tries to do race relations yeah. in this movie. I feel like but it mocks Jack Harlow, and mm. and probably deservedly so. Yeah. But it doesn't confront 
Jack Harlow. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't know, I found... I, I don't, and it I don't doesn't want, call him out. I'm just saying, it really. doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. And I don't know, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's just, you know, the world we live in. I, I, it's, it's hard I to say. I think it's a failing. I think it's a failing of it, the script. I, yeah. I, I, I think that they were trying to replicate some of those dynamics from the original White Man Can't Chub. Yeah. And they did it in a little different way, but in doing it a little different way, they lost the thread. And... They they just let that character get away with too much. Yeah, it, it feels a little too fluffy for me because the even though the original movie was a comedy, you, you there's there's stakes in that movie because when you're with Billy and he makes certain decisions, you feel bad. You're like, dude, don't do this. Like especially he should not remain with the girl at the end of this movie. No, right in the new one. Yeah, in the new no, one. No, no, you know, no. He should have been kicked to the curb. Yeah, and he should have learned some stuff. And yeah. he does not learn anything. Yeah, what's your uh, rating for this one? I could. I'm on the fence a little bit. Really? Because I think so much of the story okay. does work. Okay. And so many of the performances do work. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give it a B plus. Ooh. But it's right there on the edge. I did enjoy watching okay. the movie. Okay. And it's on Hulu. And I think I think it's worth your time. You know, I, I'm 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 right there with you as far as being on the fence. I'm gonna go a high B minus. Um, <laughs> so I'm a low B plus. Yeah, you're a so, high B minus. But it, it's only because maybe because of my love for the original movie and the and how it just it it, it can't escape the shadow of that. So, but again, there is heart to the movie with, through Lance Reddick. So, I'm gonna give it a high B minus. So we'll split on. on I didn't that regret one. watching it. No, no, no. I'll say that. So yeah, those are our thoughts on uh, White Man Can't Jump. So when we return, we're gonna kind of continue that conversation with an open discussion about uh, remakes. So stay right there. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. No. All right, welcome back to B&B &B Movie Review. So we are going to have an open discussion and we're gonna ask the questions, do remakes ruin the original film? So Brad, I wanted to bring this up, you know, coming off of White Man Can Jump, but we've had a lot of remakes just this year. Last week we talked about The Little Mermaid, you know, uh, A Man Called Otto came out back in January, which is a remake of a, of a film that came out, I think, in 2015, 16. Um, but it's a pretty I, old conversation, Brian. It's an old conversation, but I think it's one that we could kind of revisit because of some of the movies that we've had coming out. Now, I did post the questions, Is are remakes, uh, do they ruin the original film? I can answer that for you. Uh-huh. They don't. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering that. <laughs> and the show is over. And it's over. But I thought it would be I thought it would be a great conversation to have. Well, just obviously the film that you love still exists. It's exactly. On your Blu-ray, on your DVD, on your VHS, in your streaming service, wherever. Yeah. I mean, hopefully it still exists. I mean, there is a question right now with Disney and Warner Brothers yanking properties off of their yeah. feed and tossing them into oblivion. So I think if if we need to preach anything, we need to preach owning your physical media. If you love something, you better get it on <laughs> hold disc. On, hold on to that. Hold on to it. Yeah. Um, but the memory and the physical nature of that movie remains. It doesn't so, go away. You know, the new White Man Can't Jump doesn't ruin your emotional experience with the original White Man Can't Jump. The new Little Mermaid doesn't ruin your experience with the original Little yeah. Mermaid. They're still precious to you. They're still good movies. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing about this conversation is I, I'm focused more on Hollywood and how they try to uh, commercialize and really just kind of ride the backs of some of these IPs. Well, I mean, and it feels like they're they're kind of, you know, factory made yeah, and kind of homogenized. Because they are, Brian. Yeah. They're a business. It's, it's a bit. <laughs> it's even it's back, show business. Yeah, and even, and you can even say that about back in the day when they were making these movies when they were original properties. Judy Garland and the Wizard of Oz is a remake. Humphrey Bogart and the Maltese Falcon, that is a remake. Exactly. Remakes have been, have been made since the dawn of cinema, so they're not really going anywhere. You make a I good like, product, it makes a lot of money, you go, ooh, 
we should revisit that and continue to make yeah, money. You know? But it's like, can you make it your own? And you and we had this conversation a little bit off air, and you mentioned The Thing, I believe. Yeah, John Carpenter's The Thing versus The Thing from uh, Another World, the Howard yeah. Hawks production. And, you know, that is one of my favorite remakes, possibly my favorite remake, because it takes the core idea of the original and then explores something totally different thematically yeah. and also visually. Uh, you know, it, uh, it it updates and changes and becomes its own thing, pun yeah. intended. And that and that's what I, and that's why I think I, I think is the difference between remakes that were made you know 30, 40 years ago. Another one that I think about is Scarface. You know, Scarface, the the Al Pacino Scarface is is considered a classic, which uh, most people probably don't know or didn't know that that's a remake. But a lot of people revere yeah, a wildly that, different remake. They're wildly different, but a lot of people revere the Al Pacino Scarface. But my whole thing is like the remakes that are coming out now in Hollywood within the last 10 to 15 years, would these movies be considered as classics 50 years from now? Will, be they, will they be revered? Well, it's way, hard for us uh, to say it's in hard, the it's, now, It's right? hard to say, but can, can you see them being a Scarface or The Thing? I mean, I think there are probably movies that out there that are remakes that are currently being made that have a unique point of view mm -hmm. that will withstand the test of time. Not all of them, Not but most movies them. don't. Most yeah. movies don't stand the test of time. Only the classics do, right? Yeah. So for me, what a remake offers is an opportunity to revisit your love yes. of the original film, reconsider it, yes. and keep that conversation of that film alive. Yeah. And that's why when something like The Little Mermaid comes out, it's like, okay, well, what's the point of view on this Little Mermaid? Mm. And is it additive or does it subtract? Yeah. And, you know, I think, for, you know, we've already discussed these movies, but in that case, for me, it was additive yeah. and worth the venture. Yeah. And I'm, you know, we don't have these conversations when we talk about plays, right? You yeah, know, that's true. We go see Macbeth over and over and over again. Yeah. West Side Story, we'll watch it over and over and over again. You're absolutely right. And, just in the process of recasting, both in front of and behind the camera, you're going to get a new experience. It's why I love Gus Van Sant's Psycho. So many people oh. hate Gus Van Sant's Psycho because it is a shot-for-shot -shot remake, kinda. But <laughs> what the remake does is it shows you when you put somebody like Vince Vaughn in the Anthony Perkins role. It changes. Norman Bates is different. A, yeah, he's a totally different totally character. Totally different character. That's and it, yeah. take it all the way through the cast with like Anne uh, Heche, uh, in the Janet Lee role, like yeah. her version is very different. Yeah, and I think Gus Van Sant even talked about that, where he wanted to do it that way as an experiment to maybe see, you know, if if I remake this shot for shot, you know, can it be its own thing, or can we view that or see that? And differently? to me, Gus Van Sant succeeded, and I would actually yeah. like to see more shot for shot remakes mm. because. It is a celebration of performance and yeah. acting yeah. Uh, and choices. No, so, I like that. you know, like, yeah. I, I think I understand why we are being flooded with, you know, franchises and remakes and old ideas. And I understand why that can feel suffocating. And I feel suffocated sometimes by the studios force feeding us the same old <laughs> stories. And that's the problem is that yeah. a remake that is the same old thing is uninteresting. So I think give me it, something new, and yeah. whether it's a remake or not, I'll be happy. I think that it comes down to that. I just we want to see something different. If you're going to use that name, that's that's fine. But give me something different because if not, I can just pop in my old DVD and watch the original movie. Yeah. But yeah. So that's that's our conversation on remakes and uh, as opposed to the original. But let's go back and re and uh, recap the movies that we reviewed this week on the show. The Mother. Uh, we give that a B minus for both me and Brad. Uh, still, a Michael, a Michael J. Fox movie, uh, we both give that a B plus. And then we slightly split on uh, <laughs> White Man Can't Jump. Brad gives that a uh, low B plus. I give that a high B minus. Uh, Aren't those just Bs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. So, <laughs> yeah. So thank you for joining us on this latest episode of B&B Movie Reviews. Come be a part of the conversation. If you have questions, suggestions, feel free to email us at bnbmoviereviews at gmail.com. And with that, we'll see you at the movies.